Uh, turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number two. Matthew chapter number two. Now, <clears throat> as we begin this Christmas season, and today is Advent, and Advent is really nothing more than four weeks before Christmas, uh, which is exactly uh, four weeks from today. So, <clears throat> uh, a lot of Christians use Advent as a time to pray and to fast and to <clears throat> spend time growing closer to the Lord. So when, when we go through this time, I hope we never fail to remember that this entire season is a celebration of Jesus Christ. Yes, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ as God comes into the form of man as it started with a miraculous birth. We know that he lived a perfect life, that he died a despicable, horrible death, but thank God he gave us a glorious resurrection <clears throat> which finished God's full plan of true salvation to everyone, to all people. And so this is a celebration of our Savior, period. So it's important that we remember that as we go through this time. But <clears throat> as we start, the message that the Lord laid on my heart this week is a Christmas time message, but it actually happened two years after the birth of Christ. And here's where a lot of people don't always understand. We see it in our major scenes. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the people who do it. We've done it here. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It just involves them more. <clears throat> but most of the time we see the wise men involved in the manger scene. But the wise men were never at the manger scene. Now, they didn't show up till Jesus was somewhere around two years old. Most historical theologians believe just a little older than two, but not quite three. So he was still a two-year-old. When the Babylonians came in, they took all kinds of captives back with them to Babylon. We know this to be true because that's where Daniel went. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's where they went. Okay? <clears throat> so we know that they were taken to the east. And then they went through the Babylonian Empire. And then they got to the Persian Empire. And Cyrus allowed <clears throat> some of the people to go back into Jerusalem, where we learned about Ezra and Nehemiah, and they were sent back to build the walls around Jerusalem and to rebuild the city, but above all, to rebuild the temple. And they were allowed to do this under the Persian rule. But not everybody went back, and the Bible tells us that. There were a lot of them that stayed in that area because by this time there were people who had been born in that area. And so it's all they knew. So they stayed. They stayed in the same area. But they were still Jews. It hadn't changed. They were still from the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were still law-abiding, practicing Jews, and that's what they were. So <clears throat> I believe that these wise men were Jews who understood the prophets. They understood what had been said, and so God used them as he brought them here. Now we're going to go ahead and read uh, <clears throat> part of this and then we'll talk about what the Lord has laid on our heart. Let's start in verse number one. Verse number one, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, 
Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, just quickly, because I want you to understand this, just quickly, I want to run over Herod real quick with you. Because this was Herod the Great. There are more Herods that come from the Herodian family. All right? This is not the only Herod that there is. But, but this is Herod the Great, who ruled from what historically, this isn't biblically, this comes from history books, so you can take it for what it's worth, but it shows you that the timeline of Jesus Christ, it shows you that that timeline is right. All right? Biblical timelines are perfect. All right? But historically, Herod the Great ruled in Jerusalem in the area of Judea from 4 B.C. to 37 A.D., okay? But he was placed there. He called himself the kings of the Jew, but he wasn't chosen by the Jew. This is what's important, and this is what I want you to see. He was appointed by the Romans. He wasn't even a Jew. <coughs> he was not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which it took to become a Jew. He had a member of his family who was a Jew, so he told the Romans that he had Jewish blood in him, so they appointed him over the region of Judea, the land that we know today as Israel, went a little bigger. He also ruled over parts of Syria, what we know as Lebanon, even into the uh, <coughs> outer edges of Egypt, back over into the top part of Saudi Arabia. Okay, Not much into what we know today as Iraq and Iran, but his little area went that far. <coughs> but that was he was appointed by the Romans. <clears throat> but he called himself the king of the Jews because he was the ruler of the Jews. But don't ever misunderstand that Herod was a ruthless, horrible leader. Now he is, he did rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and built it extravagantly. He filled it full of gold and jewels and he made it shine and he made it sparkle for one reason and one reason only. Not because God wanted him to rebuild the temple. Not because that's what God chose to do. He did it to gain the favor of the Jews. Didn't work because the same Jews that he was trying to gain favor of, he was extremely ruthless to. He punished them. He was an extremely paranoid man all right, who later historically was proven had a lot of mental problems. But he was extremely, extremely ruthless in what he did. But he thought he was going to gain the Jews by rebuilding the temple. And he made the temple extravagant, absolutely. But he also rebuilt three other pagan temples the exact same way just to try to satisfy other people. Okay, so this is the kind of man we're dealing with. Someone who is extremely paranoid. So paranoid that... <laughs> He was afraid that his first wife was trying to poison him and she had absolutely no way of poisoning him, nor did she want to, but he had his own wife put to death because he was afraid she was trying to kill him. Had one of his sons put to death because he was afraid that he would take over his rule because he was starting to get older. And so he had one of his own sons put to death. This is the kind of man that we're dealing with, okay? And we know that to be so with what he does here later. But Herod was not a good ruler. But what I want you to see most important, where it calls him king of the Jews here, that's a Roman appointment. That's what they called him. It's not what the Jews called him, okay? Uh, <clears throat> verse number two. It says, say, where, <coughs> where is he that is born 
king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all <coughs> Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together and commanded of them where Christ should be born, and they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, <clears throat> um, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, and <clears throat> not the least among the princes of Judea, for out of thee shall come the governor that shall rule my people Israel. And this is in, this is a prophecy by Micah. And he says, <clears throat> then Herod, <clears throat> when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently where the, when the star appeared, because he wanted to know and wanted to go himself so he could put this king to death. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring him <clears throat> bring me word again that I <clears throat> may come and worship him also, which we know that was a lie. He wanted to put him to death. And when <clears throat> uh, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood where the young child was. When they, stopped, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him and when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Now, if you go on down into verse 18, and we're not going to read that part, but you will see where they go back and then Herod finds out that they have gone back and they haven't come back and told him. So the way Herod reacts in his paranoia <coughs> is that he goes into the regions of Bethlehem, not just the city, but in the regions around Bethlehem, and he has every child from the ages of two years old and under put to death trying to get rid of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the kind of man that Herod was. All right? So, <clears throat> in this, through these three wise men, I think that the Lord teaches us three things that we need to remember. All right? We need to remember them. We need to apply them. We need to think about it, we need to reflect on it, and we need to grow from these things. But the first thing I want you to stop and think about is if you had your choice of any trip, any trip in this world that you could take, right, what is your dream vacation? What trip would you take? You know, is Hawaii your dream vacation or somewhere in Europe or whatever it may be. Whatever your dream vacation is, it varies with different people because we all enjoy different things. Okay? So, <clears throat> I can tell you probably one of my 
<clears throat> dream vacations is to simply travel this country and visit some of the great historical sites that we have in our own nation. That would be a dream vacation for me, okay? To go and be able to do what? those things and just think about them because I love history so much and just visit a lot of the historical sites we have. But all of us have a trip of a lifetime that we would like to take. Well, that's exactly what happened to the wise men. They took a trip of a lifetime for them. It didn't take a few days for them to get from where they were to find Jesus Christ, to get from their area, wherever it was, even if it was around the Babylonian area, and that sits, which is <coughs> the eastern part of what we know today as Iraq. <clears throat> so, even if they came from that point and went all the way walking or even riding camels or donkeys or whatever, and to get to the point of Bethlehem, it didn't take them a week, two weeks. It took them some time. Not because it was such a great distance, but because they were following the star, but they were also searching for Jesus. Now, to prove the Jewish background, where was the first place they went? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where everything was taking place. All the way back from Abraham when he first meets with Melchizedek, all the way back to the end, Melchizedek was the ruler of what was then called Salem, which then becomes Jerusalem. All right? Later on, we know that it has great significance with Joseph, with Joshua. We can go on and on and on, but this was the center of the Jewish religion. And that's where they went. But don't forget that these men, for them, were taking a trip of a lifetime for them. Simply because they had been led to go. And so they were going. But <clears throat> the first thing that we learn is we learn about the star and the scripture. Now, we focus a lot on the star and that the star was glorious and, and it was a miraculous star. I'm not trying to deny that. God placed it there and it was there for a purpose to point them in the direction that they needed to go. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But compared to scripture, it was completely different. Because all the star could do is point them in the direction that they needed to go. They had to be willing to follow in that direction, not get off from it. They had to follow the star because the star is what was leading them to where they needed to go. But when you compare it to Scripture, there was absolutely no doubt with Scripture. Because scripture didn't just point the way to Jesus Christ. Even with the Old Testament prophets, it was extremely specific. Extremely specific information that gave them the exact thing. When he called the chief priests and scribes in, and Herod see this proves that he was not a Jew. He didn't have any idea. <clears throat> but when he said, where is the Messiah? And that's what he was asking. Where is the Messiah, the king of the Jews? Where is he going to be born? Well, automatically, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees of the time, they knew exactly where Jesus Christ was supposed to be born. In Bethlehem. Why? Because Micah talked about it almost 700 years before it ever happened. So they knew exactly that the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Now, number one, <clears throat> Bethlehem was not a popular city. Bethlehem was a poor city. 
And it wasn't somewhere that the Jews really liked to go because there was diverse people within the city of Bethlehem. There were Samaritans who were living in Bethlehem. They did not like Samaritans. Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. And to them, that didn't work. All right? So <clears throat> Bethlehem was not a high-regarded city among the Jewish people. But yet it's where God chose for Jesus Christ to have his miraculous birth. It was perfect. It was perfect for him because he knew that he was going to choose Mary to be the mother. He knew that Joseph was going to trust in God enough that he was going to go with Mary. And he knew that they were both from the lineage of David. He also knew that they were both going to live in Nazareth. And when you lived in Nazareth, where you had to go to pay your Roman taxes every year was Bethlehem. There's absolutely no accident that God planned everything to a T. Everything he did had purpose. The star had purpose. The scripture, the prophecies, they all had purpose. God set it up perfectly so that everything worked exactly the way he intended for it to work. Jesus Christ was born the way that he was born to a poor family in a <clears throat> poor environment in a stable type environment which was actually probably at that particular time historically was not a stable or a barn like you and I would see a barn today it was probably a hewed out cave in a rock All right? but it, it doesn't matter that's not what's important doesn't matter whether it was a barn like you think about a barn or some little shack it doesn't matter or if it was a hewed out cave it doesn't matter what matters is that God showed us that Jesus Christ was not born into the society of royalty in a palace. That what Jesus Christ did was for everyone, from the poor to the rich, for Jew and for Gentile. It was for everyone, and it included everyone. Didn't matter. And so Jesus Christ was born the way he was born. He was raised the way that he was raised. Everything that happened in his life was preparing for his death, his burial, and his resurrection so that he could be the savior of the world. Everything happened. And everything that I've told you, Scripture pointed to everyone. Scripture even told about Herod causing problems in the book of Jeremiah, where it talks about how Rachel was weeping for her children in Bethlehem and could not be consoled because the loss was so mournful. Prophesied about in Jeremiah. Hosea, what happens is that they flee. The first thing that happens, if you go on in to verse 13, you'll see that one of the first things that happens, God tells Joseph, get up and go to Egypt. Get up and go to Egypt and hide until Herod is, and what is so important about this is Hosea, the prophet, actually prophesies that the Messiah will come back up out of Egypt. You see, there's absolutely nothing through Scripture that is done by accident. Nothing. <clears throat> Scripture doesn't just Point us in a direction. All right, this is what I want you to understand. 
Scripture doesn't just point you in a direction. It gives you specific information on how you are to live your life. It gives you specific information so that it can remove all doubt, so that your faith can become real and true, because true faith removes doubt. We have to remember that. True faith removes doubt. If you truly trust God, then you never doubt that God can. Okay? You, we, we end up like this. I'm going I'm to tell you this, all right? Sister Connie's sitting here. She knows what she told me the other day. And so I'm going to tell you, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. True faith removes doubt, okay? <clears throat> Sister Connie had called and told me that <clears throat> our beloved Sonia, had got put back in the hospital. And that they had not given her much hope to survive. So it broke my heart because y'all know I love Sonia. Sonia, just, I love her. Okay? <clears throat> She's one of my favorite people that's ever been in the world. And so <clears throat> when she told me this, my heart broke. But I immediately began to pray that the Lord was going to hear. We called people, you all know, you got the call. We, Missy sent out all calls. She put it on our Facebook page, everything. We had people praying, okay? And we know the power of prayer. The next day, <clears throat> Sister Connie called me back to give me an update. When I looked at my phone and I saw that it was Sister Connie calling me, you know what the first, you know what the first reaction I had? My heart sank because I thought Sonia had passed away. My heart sank. And then when I got on the phone with Connie and I asked her, it was positive news. Sonia was doing better. Sonia was doing a little better than she had before. And then automatically, immediately, I felt like a fool. I got off the phone, and I was so thankful, and I said, thank you, Lord. And I was with my dad at the time. And I looked at dad, and I said, I'm just like those idiots who prayed for Peter. And dad's like, what the world are you talking about? I said, you remember when Peter was in prison? And when Peter was in prison and all those people were gathered in Mark's house to pray for Peter to get out of prison? Yes. And pre Peter goes to the door and he knocks on the door. And when he knocks on the door and the little girl opens and slams the door back in his face because she's astonished. And she runs back upstairs and she tells those people, Peter's at the door. And you know what their answer was? You're crazy. Peter's in prison. Their prayers had already been answered. But they didn't have enough faith to believe that what they, pray, what they were praying was true. And that's exactly what I felt like. Because I said my heart sank when I saw that it was calm. You know what that is? Doubt. That ain't what I prayed. That's not at all what I prayed. Do I believe that the Lord has power? Absolutely, or I wouldn't ask him. But you see how just a, a little doubt creeping in can cause us a lot of problems? It affects our faith. It affects your ability to trust God. And if it affects your ability to trust God, then it affects your ability to trust Scripture. No. And so that's why I felt about this small, because I realized that my faith was weak. And so from that moment, I said, Lord, I will never doubt because I know you have the power. So the next time Connie called me back, I smiled all over because I knew it was good news. And it was. She was getting even better. And they had moved her into a room. You see, <clears throat> if we say we trust God, but how much do we truly trust God? We say that we believe every word that is written in Scripture, but how much do we truly trust that Scripture? That's why I am so adamant that it is so important for you not to just read the Bible, but to study the Bible. Know what God wants you to do. Because Scripture doesn't just point you in the direction. It gives you specific information on how to reach where you're going. Period. Just like the wise men. If they had truly 
search the scripture. They'd have known to never go to Jerusalem. Because that's not where he was. That's where he's going to be when he sets up his kingdom. Absolutely. But that's not where he was. So that's the difference. They followed the star. Absolutely, because God was pointing them in the direction they needed to go. They lost the star for a period of time. Did you catch that in Scripture? They didn't see it. You know why they didn't see it? Because in their mind, they were going to where the king was going to be. That they knew. But they didn't go the way the star was pointing. That's why it's so important that we follow Scripture and understand Scripture. So that we know the specific information. <clears throat> then the next thing we see is we see the difference between a baby and a king. Right? <clears throat> Benjamin Brown wrote a little book. I don't know if any of y'all have ever read Benjamin Brown or not. But he's, a, he's a good Christian author. Wrote several things. But they're usually little short books. Nothing great big detail whatever. He says a few words but it's really good. Kind of like Max Lucado, if you ever read any of Max Lucado's stuff, he's kind of short and straight to the point. Gives you a lot of little short stories, not really one big long story. Benjamin Brown's kind of the, the same way. But <laughs> Benjamin Brown wrote this little book one time about Christmas Christians and how that Christmas Christians are a huge hindrance to all other Christians. And he uses the same term with, and you may say, what? You say that? No, but he uses the same term with Easter Christians, okay? People who only go to church during those times of celebration at Jesus' birth or at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter. But they're a huge hindrance. But what he was saying is that Christmas Christians will never mature because they always keep Jesus as a baby in a manger. And that's so true. There are so many Christians who keep Jesus Christ as a baby on a manger. Or Easter Christians who keep Jesus Christ on the cross. But our Jesus Christ is a resurrected living Savior, so you can't keep him on the cross. And Jesus Christ grew up so you can't keep him as a baby. It won't work. It's wonderful to celebrate this miraculous birth of our Savior. Being born to a virgin, it's physically impossible, but not with God. We know that that works. You have to believe that. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, how are you ever going to believe in a resurrected living Savior? You see, how are you ever going to believe that this man could live a perfect life? You can't. You have to believe it all. So it's extremely important, and there's nothing wrong with celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. It's a wonderful thing. But don't keep him as a baby in a manger because all babies grow up. <clears throat> and we always tell them, it's not important what you are now, as a little child, because they're still learning. <clears throat> you still have to correct them over and over and over, usually for the same thing. As a parent and as a grandparent, it gets extremely aggravating sometimes when you keep telling the child the same thing 47 times. Okay? So, <clears throat> but that's because they're still maturing and still growing. Just as we are, from the day we get saved, we began to mature in Christ, I hope. The problem is, is that a lot of people never get off the mill. They never know the word. They never know what God intends for them to be. They take all the words of their preachers or teachers or deacons or whoever. They take their words for everything, and they have no idea what God said. All they know is what the preacher said. Okay? Well, there's a lot of preachers who are teaching things that are not true. That's what we've been talking about a little bit 
in our Bible study. Is there's a lot of false teachers out there that people are still following today. There's a lot of congregations who are teaching things that are not scripturally true, and there are millions of people who are following them, believing that everything is true because they follow the understanding and the precepts of man instead of the word of God. So they're fake. And all those preachers are is a lot of false teachers, not teaching the truth. Now, there's plenty of people preaching the truth. I'm not going to make you in despair and think that there's not a lot of preachers out there telling you the truth because there absolutely is. <clears throat> but there's just as many who aren't. So we need to remember that. But you see, <clears throat> we grow up and we teach our children what is important is what you can become. Okay, <clears throat> you get an education so that you can gain wisdom and knowledge and so that you can get a decent job, make a decent wage, provide for yourself a decent place to live so that you can have decent vehicles, so that you can have decent things, okay? This is the information that we provide for them to help them when they mature, <clears throat> okay? When you're a baby, you're learning. You have to go from milk to baby food before you ever get to meat, all right? That's the way it works. Works the same way spiritually. But it's not what you are as a baby that makes a difference. It's what you become that makes a difference. The same thing with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born into this world to become the savior of the world, to become the king of kings and the lord of lords. From baby to king. And we know that one day he will set up his kingdom and he will rule. And we know that he will first come back and rule in that thousand year millennial reign, which is just a snapshot of what you and I will know as heaven. Then there's going to be a period of time where Satan is going to be released People are going to sin. We know that to be so. Then Jesus Christ is going to set us up in our new Jerusalem. Right, we know all that. There's a lot more details in between, but we all get the gist. Okay? So we know this is going to happen, that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. Absolutely. Positively. He is the king. And when the wise men came, now stop and think about it. When the wise men came, they didn't give him baby gifts or kid gifts. If you went out today to shop for a two-year-old, why are you going to take them? I mean, you seriously think if you go shop for a two-year-old, what are you taking to a two-year-old? You're going to take it toys or diapers or something that it can use as a two-year-old. You don't take a two-year-old grown-up clothes. You're not going to take clothes out of your closet and go take to a two-year-old. That'd be kind of stupid. Give that to them at the birthday party, would you? Oh, they'll grow into it. Of course, in Shantae's, uh, you know, way of thinking, they'll grow into it by the time they're five. And so, so she... <laughs> but what we see <clears throat> is that what they brought were gifts for royalty. They brought gifts for a king because they knew who he was going to be. And each gift is important. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. You think about that. You think these gifts were accident that they came? No. <laughs> someone I, I heard someone talking about it one time and they said, well, gold is a symbol of royalty. And so... When you have that, you have this symbol of royalty. It showed that he truly was the king. Gold didn't have anything to do with royalty. Does royalty have gold? Absolutely. All right. But that doesn't make gold a part of royalty. The symbol of gold is purity. Purity. The whole purpose for it is that it be pure. We all know what it is to be tried by fire that we see so many times in the Word of God. And they use gold as the same idea. Right? When you heat it and all the impurities float to the top and you rake all those impurities off and what you have left is 100% pure. 
pure gold. Gold is a representing of true purity. Fully righteous. That's Jesus Christ. Frankincense is a symbol of deity. We say, well, we all know that we've heard the word deity, but how many of us truly understand the word deity? All right. One of the easiest explanations I know to give for deity is it is the full nature of God. Now, I want you to stop and think about that because that's not the way that a lot of dictionaries are going to describe it, okay? But it is fully true. It is the full nature of God. Everybody says, well, of deity means it is God. No, it's deeper than that. It's not just God. We all know the supreme God, the almighty God, the omnipotent God that sees and knows all. We know God. All right? But the deity of God is his nature. What becomes natural to him? His supreme power. His divine power. So when you think about it, what we find is his nature. What becomes natural to God is to never ever sin. He hates it. To never do anything but the good for others. To give everyone a choice and a chance but with the full understanding that you know he is the almighty God and if you choose wrong, there is a payday someday. And that payday is eternal separation from God in the tortuous fires of hell. But it's real and it's true. But that's not God's nature. Frankincense is a symbol of God's pure great, divine, supreme nature. How his thoughts are not our thoughts and our thoughts are not his thoughts. Why? Because our thoughts are not of always of purity. He is always all. That's his true deity, his true nature. And then myrrh, we know, is a symbol. It was a spice that was used primarily by extremely rich people to put, because there was no embalming at this time, okay? So it was a spice that was added to rich people when they were buried. Which brings us back to that despicable, horrible death, the payment for sin. And the only way that we're ever going to receive that payment of sin, that redemption, that atonement, the only way you're ever going to receive it is because of the purity and the pure supreme nature of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Without that, then all you have is a horrible death. But because of that, what we have is a glorious resurrection. You see, every one of these gifts had purpose to show the world who he truly was. They gave him the gifts of a king because they knew who he was going to be. They didn't just treat him like a baby. They didn't just treat him like a two-year-old. They treated him like a king of kings and the Lord of Lords. How do we treat Jesus Christ? You may not treat him like a baby in a manger, but do you treat him like the Lord of Lords? Do you treat him the way that he should be treated in your life? Do you understand the purity, the deity, and the payment that was made for us? Do we understand it? Do we remember it? Do we reflect on it? Because these three men understood it full well. When they worshipped him, they didn't worship him as a two-year-old little boy. They worshipped him as the Lord. Think about it. Is that the way we would react and act today? No. Most of us not. 
<coughs> and then the third and last thing, I got a hush. But we see joy and sorrow. When the wise men left, what were they doing? They left with exceeding joy. They were thrilled to death. A few days later, Bethlehem was filled with sorrow. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says that Jesus Christ is a man of sorrows. Acquainted, he knows grief. Do we remember Isaiah 53? It was the prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You will find in the next verse where it talks about with his stripes we are healed. We all know that one. But we see that he was a man of sorrows. He lived a sorrowful life. Jesus Christ didn't live a great fantastic life. He was God in the flesh. And he didn't come here and live a wonderful life where he had lots of money and lots of land and people waved on him hand and foot. He, all he ever had was the clothes on his back. <laughs> it's all he ever had. If we were to look at Jesus Christ today and we were to measure his financial success, how many people would find him successful in the world? None. He didn't own any land. He didn't own any house. <coughs> he didn't inherit anything from Joseph and his mama. He didn't have any of that stuff. All he had were the clothes on his back and shoes on his feet. That's all he had. That's all the material goods he possessed. That was it. Lots of times he went hungry. He didn't eat. Lots of times he lost sleep. Lots of times he had lots of problems. <clears throat> thinking all the times he got aggravated even in his ministry with his own disciples who were great men but sometimes didn't always do what they wanted to you remember one time he called Peter a hypocrite he even compared Peter to a Pharisee which were fully hypocrites he even said Peter one time was acting like a child of Satan because of what he asked Jesus to do now, was Peter a child of Satan? No, that's not what he meant. We all know that Peter's just as saved as me and you. It doesn't have anything to do with that. But Peter was doing some things that weren't right. And Jesus had to correct him. <clears throat> but you see, he was full of sorrow. <clears throat> he watched people suffer for his name's sake. And he even told you and I that our life was going to be full of sorrow and grief, not roses and candy, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough if you're going to serve God. He told us that. But what's the difference? He said, I'm a man full of sorrows. Yes, fully acquainted with grief. You will suffer. But what did he promise us? Joy. I will fill you with joy. You know what the number one ingredient that's in joy is? Without this ingredient, you can't have joy. That ingredient is peace. The peace of God. Not peace of the world. Peace from God. Without that, you can't have joy. And you can't get the peace of God without salvation. Won't work. So when we have that and we have the peace of God, then our heart is filled with joy. Why? Because we know he's in control. We know that he knows what he's doing. We know that he can accomplish anything. And that God, I trust you. And it fills our heart full of joy. You see, <clears throat> we may suffer through some sorrowful times in our lives. Absolutely positive. But if we trust God, he will always fill our hearts with joy, no matter how bad the situation. You have to trust him. God doesn't give you everything that you ask for. But he gives you what is right and what is perfect. <clears throat> I always think, and especially... You know, during Thanksgiving. But I'll, this verse always comes to my mind all year. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. And people misunderstand this verse so much because of this. Because what does it say? In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will in Christ Jesus 
concerning you. And everybody thinks, well, I've got to be thankful for every situation that happens to me. And that's hard to do. That's not what it said. Did you hear what it said? It didn't say for everything give thanks. He said in everything give thanks. Not for it, but while you're in it, remember who's in control. Remember who is above all. It's not for everything that you're thankful. It's in everything you are thankful. Because this is God's will. <coughs> not that you suffer. All right? That's not God's will. It's not God's will that you face problems and sickness and trials and trouble. That's not God's will. But what God's will is, is that God's purpose is to help you through every suffering, trouble, trial, sickness you face. And while you're in it, be thankful, knowing that God is going to bring you through it, that God is going to help you. Don't be thankful for the problem. Be thankful in the problem. Do you see the difference? <laughs> And people hear that verse, and I've heard a preacher preach that verse one time, and I sat there and bit my lip and listened to him because that's exactly what he was saying. Oh, we have to be thankful for all the problems. No, you don't. don't be thankful for the terrible things in your life. That's not something to be thankful for. God didn't want you to be thankful for that. God wanted you to be thankful in that. Don't forget that. In it, not for it. All right? <coughs> So let's look at these men. They left full of joy. What happened? They got their trip of a lifetime. And what happened to them at the end of it? They were changed forever. Changed forever. Simply because they visited a two-year-old little boy that they never saw as a two-year-old little boy. They saw him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They saw him as what one day was going to become the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. They saw him as the Savior of the world. You remember what Jesus Christ taught himself? We all know John 3, 16, but John 3, 17 is <coughs> even more important. We know that God loved us enough that he gave us his son. Uh, but what we see is that Jesus Christ himself that said that he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They treated him as a savior. And their lives were changed forever. Now, we're challenged to do the same thing. You can look at it through this Christmas season. You can look at it whatever. But I, I don't care if you do it through this Christmas season. I don't care if you're doing it for Christmas or not for Christmas. What I care about is that we focus on the idea of living a changed life. A life that is changed forever because we dedicate ourselves to Jesus Christ. If we want Calvary Church to grow, if we want to grow in number, it's never going to happen till each one of us, everybody in this room this morning, until we grow spiritually, that's not going to happen. So we have to grow, and we have to live a changed life, not just talk about it but live it, just as the wise men. Live a changed life. That's your challenge this morning. Are you ready to change your life and live a changed life forever? It's up to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you this morning. We thank you above all for our salvation. We thank you for our glorious Savior. Lord, we thank you that he was born to a virgin, that he lived a perfect life. Lord, we thank you for <clears throat> the penalty that he paid for us so that we didn't have to. 
But Lord, we thank you for that resurrection morning. Lord, when he came out of that tomb as a living Savior and gave us the opportunity to live a life, Lord, knowing that we will live eternally in your presence. God, we thank you for that today. We pray that we will never forget it. We will never forget the glorious miracles that you perform in our lives, in our church, in our community every day. Lord, we pray that you will help us to see within ourselves, see what changes need to be made to live a life that is suitable in your eyes. Lord, help us to make those changes so that we can grow spiritually, so that this can be the lighthouse that you want it to be. Lord, because we know if we don't that it's going to fail. Lord, we pray that you help us, Lord, lift us, help us to become more so we can do more in your name and for your service. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Anybody got a, a word, testimony, anything?